Thank you very much for having me to talk. Um, it's um, uh, it's always enjoyable to be here watching these things and um, every week. And this time, um, I hope you'll be interested in following um, following a detour into Herodotian reception in the Byzantine period. Um, you'll quickly notice that this is really work in progress. And what it's um, going to be focused on today is my attempts to come to grips with one particular manuscript, um, a Greek one today in Florence, which I think is an extremely rich source for Herodotian reception in the decades before and after the fall of Byzantium. So the subject of the manuscript today is, oh, let me see if I can circulate through, great, is this text, um, uh, a manuscript uh, which I first came across several years ago after a very illuminating exchange with uh, Aslihan Akizik, who is here today, happily, um, who was then writing a PhD on Laonicus Calcacondyles and the reception of Herodotus. And as I looked into it more and more, I became more and more intrigued by its peculiarities. Um, its formal name, uh, its shelf mark, is Laurentianus Plutei Grecos 70.6, but for the sake of brevity and their sanity, I'm going to call it by its siglum, uh, the most uh, common siglum anyway, which is just the letter T. So when you hear me talking about T, I'm talking about this text. Um, now, this manuscript contains nothing other than Herodotus's histories, um, written uh, originally, as a scribal note tells us, in 1318 by a certain Nicolaus Triclinis, who was probably a relative, perhaps a brother, of the more famous Byzantine scholar, Demetrios Triclinis. Um, the only part of the main text of the manuscript, which is not in the hand of Triclinis, are two folia towards the end of book four of the histories in a later and obviously different hand from the rest of the text, um, which Daniela Bianconi identified as the hand of Georgios Gemistos, the controversial neo-pagan philosopher who took the name Pletho in later life. And you can see here on this slide on the right, um, you can see the first of the folio in Pletho's hand, which is um, obviously even at first glance visually different from the text in, um, in Triclini's hand on the left. Now in what follows, um, I'll talk several times about the bifolium uh, in Pletho's hand. Um, and by that, I mean these two folia added by Pletho to fill a lacuna. <laughs> down a number of different changes during the manuscript's history. So this manuscript, T, was copied um, at least half a dozen times, and it stands at the head of a large subfamily of manuscripts of Herodotus. In all, probably some two dozen manuscripts of the histories, which is roughly a third of all the manuscripts we have, seem to derive their text in part or in full, directly or indirectly, from T. And most of these are listed at the start of the Word document, which I sent around as a handout. Um, and I hope everybody does have the handout, but if you don't, um, do write in the chat and I can post it in again. Um, so T seems to have passed through the hands of some of the most famous figures of the late Byzantine world, who at the same time played an important role in the baptism of Renaissance Italy into ancient Greek culture. In addition to Pletho, already mentioned, who you can see figured at the top here with a somewhat shifty gaze. Um, the text was owned, copied or annotated by at least three of his students or friends. Bessarion um, on the left, an Orthodox monk um, in Greece initially, later a Catholic Cardinal in Rome, who um, worked his way into, uh, well, I, let's say by the 1460s, sat at the center of a vast web of scholars, um, nobles and philosophers, including many Greeks who lived in exile after the fall of Byzantium in 1453. Second, the classicizing historian Laonicus Calcacondyles, who many Herodotian scholars will know because he wrote a history of the fall of the Byzantine Empire um, and the rise of the Ottomans in the mid 15th century on the model of Herodotus and Thucydides, recently published and translated by Anthony Caldelis. Um, third, the less well-known uh, but equally fascinating figure of Demetrius Raoul or Rallis Kabakis, 
of whom no picture survives, um, a self-described Spartan and a member of the Peloponnesian nobility, later governor of Imbros and Lemnos under Demetrius Palaiologos and the Ottoman Empire. Now, Kavakis, uh, like Pletho, cultivated um, neo-pagan beliefs of one sort or another, um, in Kabaki's case, centered around the worship of the sun. And after Pletho's death and the fall of the Byzantine Empire, Kabakis eventually fled west uh, to Italy and joined the large community of Greeks exiled in Rome, who clustered around Vasarion and his academy. And here Kabakis lived out his final years, doing occasional diplomatic services as far away as Russia, and copying out ancient literature and excerpts often based around the theme of the sun and sun worship in his very idiosyncratic and semi-illiterate spelling. But back to our manuscript of Herodotus T. It turns out that a great deal of work was done on this manuscript in the century and a half after its creation in 1318. And this work was of various types. It was both philological um, in correcting faulty passages by, by emendation, sometimes actually uh, emendations of brilliant quality, which we know without uh, attaching them to Plato's name. But the work was sometimes also ideological. And on at least two uh, occasions, we find that someone removed or rewrote portions of the text, which they didn't like for some reason. Now, the first deletion um, of this type comes during the famous dialogue between Solon and Croesus. As you will know, when Solon gives first and second place in happiness to Tellus, Clevis, and Biton, Croesus, uh, annoyed, asks Solon to explain his choice. And Solon begins with his discourse on the transience of human prosperity with the words which you can read on the left of this slide. Croesus, you ask me about human affairs when I know that the divine is entirely Thonaron tekai tarakodes, grudging, jealous, and meddlesome. Except in our manuscript, T and many of its copies, the text today reads something else. Croesus, you ask me about your own affairs when I know that human affairs never stay in the same place. Croise epistaminon me to anthropinon pan udama en toyatoi menon epirotais ton seo tu pragmaton peri. As you can see, if we return to the manuscript in uh, more detail, a later hand has erased several of the original words and in a slightly darker ink has written a replacement text into the space. The new text strives for Herodotus's Ionic dialect with the dialectical spellings seoutu instead of the classical Athenian seoutu, and it borrows language which closely echoes other passages from the histories, specifically the comment on the transience of human affairs at 1.5. Uh, the result um, fits seamlessly into the new context, um, both in its visual form, but also in its broad content. But it removes the description of the divine as thonoron tekai tarakodes. The second, um, let's say, ideological intervention, which I'll show you, is executed somewhat less artfully and has already been spotted by other people this is uh, not this one, it's this one here. Um, this comes later in the first book of the histories um, in Herodotus' description of the customs of the Persians. Um, and here, as you can see, a hand has just deleted a phrase which occurs during the description of the Persian religion. Uh, the text, which you can follow on this slide, um, reads as follows, and the deletion is what's underlined on the slide. It's their custom, Herodotus says, to perform sacrifices to Zeus, going up to the most lofty mountains, since they call the whole circle of the heavens Zeus. So that's the deletion. Ton kuklon panta tu uranu dia kaleontes. And they sacrifice to the sun and the moon and the earth, fire, water, and the winds. So as you can see, a later hand has just uh, taken out a part of the original sentence written by Nic Nicolaus Triclinius. The intervention is small and fairly precise and removes a very specific claim about Persian theology. So one of the aims of the rest of this talk is to explore these and a few other changes made to the manuscript between the late 14th and mid 15th centuries and ask what they tell us about how Herodotus was read in this period.
The evidence points to the conclusion that these interventions were made by the neo-pagan philosopher Pletho while residing at the despotate of Mystra in the Peloponnese. And here's a rather sort of dramatic picture of Mystra for you. Um, Mystra, uh, for those more familiar with, familiar with the ancient geography of Greece, is uh, a town near to the ancient um, site of Sparta, which became the second city of the Byzantine Empire after the fall of Thessaloniki in 1430. Since, as I mentioned, tea was copied many times, and since some of these copies contain notes by the scribes who made them, indicating the date and sometimes also the place where they were copied, it's possible to reconstruct the textual evolution of tea in some detail, and sometimes also its movements and probable owners. Several of these copies seem to be entirely uncontaminated in textual terms, uh, that is to copy tea and only tea. And so we can use these manuscripts with appropriate caution, uh, like low quality photographs of tea taken at different points in its history. By comparing the text of tea as we have it today with the various dated copies, we can establish a time frame within which the alterations which we see in T must have taken place and zoom in on the people responsible. So this is what I try to do in the two handouts I've given you. And this is the point for anybody who doesn't have the handout to write in the chat so that I can post it back in. Um, uh, right, the first of the handouts is this um, slide here, which you can see um, which I, I fear is going to be too small to have a proper look at on the, on the, um, on the slide itself, but um, which you should have separately. Now this attempts to plot the history of tea visually over time. Tea itself is sort of the trunk in the middle represented by the dotted line, um, which runs down the center. Um, and I've labeled its text at various different stages with the six Greek letters, alpha to zeta. The straight lines coming out from the center represent copies of T, which allow us to reconstruct the text as it seems to have looked in various different periods. The second handout, which is the rather horrifying word document, um, is the list of corrections which T underwent listed chronologically um, and in the form you'd expect to find them in an apparatus criticus. Together, they build up a picture of progressive tampering with the text of various different types in different stages. In an early copy of 1372, we can see that a handful of linguistic changes um, or corrections have already taken place. And that's the phase that I call um, T beta. In a copy of 1436, we find that these, we find these and even more, in, uh, which is T gamma. In a copy of 1469, we find even more. And in a copy of 1480, the text has reached pretty much the state that we find it today. Um, now to make all this clearer, I'm gonna first give you a quick overview of some of the more important copies, or let's say more useful copies of T, to, um, to sort of make this a little bit more, um, more obvious what, what exactly, how, how exactly this, this method of dating the um, textual interventions works. So T was created, as I mentioned, in 1318 by Nicolaus Triclinis, probably in Thessaloniki, although he doesn't name the location. In 1372, it was copied by a scribe who identifies himself in a dated note as Constantinus, priest and cartofulax at Pisa near ancient Olympus. And he says that he made his copy in Astros, which is in the Eastern Peloponnese. You can see it there marked with an X. Um, the manuscript is today in Paris uh, and so it has the name Parisinus Grecos 1634. And it's not, probably not the earliest copy of T, but it's the first dated copy, which makes it useful for us. And for our purposes today, the most important point is that the vast majority of textual interventions are not found in this text, which we find in T today, are not here in this text, which means they must have been made after T was copied uh, in 1372 to make this, this manuscript. Uh, Parisinus 1634, for example, transmits the text of Solon's speech to Croesus exactly as we know it from the wider tradition. Um, and whereas T today has the two new bifolia, uh, or the two new folia inserted by Pletho, uh, the bifolium I referred to earlier at the end of book four, Parisinus Greco's 1634 um, clearly copied T before this was added. 
because um, a, because it seems to have had a lacuna in the text, which a later hand has supplemented. Um, and if you compare the supplemented text here and the text which is added into T, you can see that they're actually very different. Um, and this, you can see that actually here at the bottom, about 10 lines up on the left hand side, um, you can see where a later hand has rewritten part of the text to allow the filling of the lacuna. Now in 1436, T was copied um, by the Orthodox monk Bessarion, as uh, a subscription tells us. And we know from other evidence that Bessarion on this date um, was in his late 30s at the end of a six year period studying with Pletho and Mistra. Mistra is here again marked with X. So the uh, T seems to have moved sort of a little bit southwest, but to be still um, in broadly the speaking the same geographical area. The codex which Bessarion made, today Marcianus Grecus 365, is a compilation of the classical historians, Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon's Hellenica. And it looks very much like a scholar's working copy. It's in a fairly cramped hand. It has a few decorative details, um, but it's on, uh, it's on paper, not, um, not expensive parchment or anything like that. In Bessarion's copy of T, we read the new text of Solon's speech, and there is no sign of the Persians calling the circle of the sky Zeus, which gives us um, a fairly fit, uh, clear date window in which this deletion must have taken place between 1372, when Constantinus made his copy, and 1436, when Bessarion made his. Interestingly, the bifolium in Pletho's hand, um, restoring the lacuna in book four, is still not in place because in the main text of Bessarion's manuscript, um, the text is simply missed out um, and you have exactly the same lacuna as you have in T. And Bessarion clearly went back and copied and noticed this and at a later date went back and copied it in on this mini folium, which you can see here on the left hand side. Um, and the text which he copied in is again a very different one from that which Pletho copied into T. One more copy um, was made um, by an unknown scribe at an unknown date um, and produced this manuscript, Laurentianus Plutei Grecus, uh, 70.32. Um, and here for the first time, we find a text which actually has the bifolium copied into it um, in the hand of the first scribe, which matches the text of Pletho. So this was clearly copied from T once um, the extra text had been supplemented. And in 1469, T was copied once again by the Cretan scribe and priest John Plusirenos, making another collected volume of the Greek historians, today Marcianus Grecus 364. At this time, Plusirenos was a priest on Venetian Crete um, all the way through the 1460s, uh, who favoured the, uh, well, on one of the major sort of political and religious questions of the day, he favoured the union of the Catholic and Orthodox churches and was sponsored in his position by Bessarion. Um, but when, uh, and, and Plusidenus eventually ended up in Italy in 1470, in, by, at some point by the early 1470s, which makes it difficult to place him in 1469. But um, it seems most likely from comparison of the other materials that he copied across here, that Plusidenus was in Italy, probably in Venice or Rome when he copied this text. It was made for Bessarion, and those are, you can see this um, close, uh, the, the zoomed in picture at the top right is the, the arms of Bessarion, and at the end, there's a, a dedication to him. And um, it's, uh, it's clearly a, a very beautiful presentation copy, which has been made um, without the sparing of any expense or time. And Plusidanus' text is substantially um, the same as what we find in T today. The text of the bifolium is no longer missing and, um, and is seamlessly included in the first hand. One more. The text of um, T was copied once again in 1480 by uh, Dimitrios Raul Kabakis, this time definitely in Rome, by the neo-pagan admirer and erstwhile friend of Pletho. As you can see here, Kabakis marks the date of his copying not by the normal Byzantine or Roman systems, Anna Mundi, the Byzantine tax indiction year or the pontifical year, but rather by the progress of the Ottoman conquest of the Mediterranean. Written in the year in which the Turks took Otranto, he says. The manuscript contains a wonderful set of annotations by Kabakis himself, 
three of them dated to 1480, 1486, and 1487, including direct responses to the text, autobiographical laments, and addresses to Herodotus and occasionally other protagonists in the work. And um, I've, I'm actually preparing a brief edition of these at the moment, and if people want to talk about them later, um, uh, we can. Now, I've just bombarded you here with this list of five copies of T, which allows us to trace its journey from Astros in 1372 to Mistra by 1436, and then across the Adriatic to Italy by 1469, and definitely to Rome by 1480. Now, I'm far from the first person to note um, that this long series of copies of T exist, but between them, the textual work, which um, is represented on the handouts, allows us to reconstruct also the order and the rough date at which people fiddled around with the text of Herodotus. And if people want to, we can talk about the stemma and uh, to what degree it's reliable um, and where there's, there's room for other forms of reconstruction. But for now, I'll leave that there. Um, it's worth noting that the T family has largely escaped painstaking text critical study to date because it's simply not important for editors of Herodotus. The first thing an editor does um, on beginning to study the textual tradition is to eliminate all the, cop all the direct copies of T from consideration on the principle of eliminatio codicum because we have the subarchetype, which is T itself. Because T is connected with so many interesting people, it's attracted a wide range of hypotheses, linking it in various ways to famous figures in um, Byzantine and Renaissance um, culture, as well as in Herodotian scholarship. It's attract, um, right, and, and these links um, are actually, some of them fairly tendentious or um, demonstrably wrong. These include the theory that um, Valer used T to make his Latin translation, for which um, there doesn't seem to be any good evidence. It also includes the claim that Valer added uh, the marginal text, which fills several of the lacun lacunae in the later books of T, uh, which, so for example, this one you can see here in the picture, there's a little bit of text supplied. I think this is from book six. Um, but these were in fact added by Kabakis around 1480, not by Valer. Um, likewise, there's, there's the theory uh, of Hemmerdinger, which Anthony Caldelis already cast into doubt, that Laonicus Calcocondyles was the one responsible for the textual corrections in T. And this stems from, um, from the fact that T was clearly at some point in the possession of Laonicus, since Laonicus signed the last page of T with a possessor's note, which contains an elaborate eulogy of the ancient Hellenes and their herald Herodotus. Um, I won't read this out, but it's an interesting text in itself, which uh, Astley has talked about. Um, <clears throat> so it's understandable that people have thought, oh, perhaps this is um, the, the, the corrections we find here are the work of Laonicus. But since Laonicus was born circa 1430, and the majority of the textual corrections we'll look at had taken place by 1436, he would really have to have been a very precocious child to have been responsible for them. Um, so enough theories, um, enough on these sort of various different theories that T has um, accumulated. Um, these are basically the, um, the text critical tools of which are the basis for the rest of the discussion that, um, that I'll, I'll move on to in the second half of the paper, which is um, to ask who fiddled with Herodotus' text and when. And you can see here who I think it was. So let's begin with the deletions, um, which I showed you at the start, um, deletions and rewriting. Um, after I first noticed them uh, in 2015, I rashly suggested that the deletion of, um, or the rewriting of Solon's speech might be the work of Kabakis, but this is definitely wrong. They must be the work of Pletho. Um, Bianconi, as I mentioned at the start, identified the hand of the bifolium as Pletho's, and it seems certain that the manuscript belonged to him in some capacity at some point. It was copied by his pupil Bessarion in 1436, and later on it was signed by his other pupil Laonicus. And more recently, Fabio Pagani has suggested that Pletho was responsible for the second deletion I showed you on the Persians calling the circle of the sky Zeus. In what follows, I'll argue that Pagani was correct in identifying Pletho as the deleter, 
I'll suggest that we can date the deletion to before 1436 on the basis of Bessarion's copy. And I'll suggest that this is part of a wider phenomenon than has been realized, including the rewriting of Solon's speech and a whole series of other editorial interventions of a more textual nature. But it's worth reviewing briefly what's known of Pletho's life, um, which is frustratingly little, unfortunately. Um, he was born uh, around the late 1350s, um, and his early years are, relatively speaking, a blank. After his death, his embittered enemy, Scholarius, claimed that Pletho had studied with Elisaeus, a Jew, in the court of the Ottomans, and that it was here that he developed his nefarious taste for paganism, and that he was consequently expelled from Constantinople on suspicion of heresy by the Emperor Manuel sometime after 1391. Um, the reliability of these polemical claims made something approaching a century after the events they purport to describe um, has been questioned. Uh, but there are other signs that Pletho was in Mistra um, in the Despotate of Moria around 1409, and he's tested there at the very latest by 1422. Um, we only have evidence for him leaving Mistra in 1438 to 9, which doesn't mean to say that he didn't leave Mistra, but this is the only episode we know of. In 1438 to 9, uh, Pletho attended the church council of Ferrara and Florence as one of the few laymen in the small Greek delegation at the invitation of the Byzantine emperor. And here, and of course, the topic was the, the potential union of the Orthodox and Catholic churches, uh, which Pletho opposed. This visit took on legendary significance in the stories, in later stories of the Translatio Studii from Greece to Italy on the account of Massilio Ficino much later, whose historicity has been disputed for fairly good reasons, Pletho's lectures in Florence were what inspired Cosmo de' Medici to found a Platonic Academy. Um, more certain, or in fact probable, uh, unlike the last fact, is that in 1447, Pletho was visited in Mistra by Ciriaco d'Ancona and given a tour of the ruins, uh, when Chiriaco was actually given a tour of the ruins of Sparta by Laonikos, um, then a young boy of about 17. And it was probably at this point that Pletho and um, Chiriaco worked closely on several documents which appear in both their hands, so you can see here um, in the slide, um, and worked together on the text of Strabo. Many sources um, demonstrate that Pletho was viewed as one of the foremost philosophers of the Byzantine world, and he also maintained a close relationship with the despots of Moria throughout his later life. The philosophical position for which he was best known during his life was his assertion of the superiority of Plato over Aristotle, which brought him into conflict with other people, including Scholarius. But his infamy was first established by his nomoi, or laws, named, of course, in allusion to Plato. These only became public after his death when they were seized by the despots, the despots of Moria, who declined several requests to copy them, they claimed, and instead delivered them to Scholarios, Pletho's enemy, who under the Ottomans had been appointed patriarch of the Orthodox Church. Scholarius uh, tells us that he declared the text anathema and burnt it, um, disposing of everything aside from the index. Um, but we do have substantial portions of the text today because they seem to have been copied at some point before their burning by Kabakis, who presumably brought them to, to Rome with him around 1466. From the surviving sections, we know that um, we know that um, that Pletho's laws expounded a peculiar brand of Neoplatonic philosophy, identifying the Olympian deities with the gods of the philosophers. Pletho saw Zeus as the eternal uncreated father and supreme head of the pantheon, whose will was carried out by all the lesser divinities who emanated from him, first Poseidon and, interestingly, Poseidon's consort Hera, um, followed by various lower levels of divinity. This philosophical pantheon was divided into the legitimate children of Zeus on Olympus and the illegitimate in Tartarus. And the laws outlined prayers to these pagan divinities and discussed various aspects of their nature and the rest of his metaphysical system. I won't open up the, the broader debate about whether there is some way in which um, Pletho's um, theological system could be 
um, reconcilable with Christianity and um, resulting in the fact that he isn't actually a neo-pagan. Um, it seems to me fairly clear that um, that Pletho was um, was not uh, didn't consider himself to be part of the uh, the Christian theological tradition. Um, but we can talk about that afterwards if people are interested. So, what connection is there between the deletions I showed you in T and Pletho's views as we have them from his surviving writings? Here we need to duck back a bit in time and look at how Herodotus' text might have sounded to Byzantine ears, because in the 2000 years between 500 BC and 1500 AD, um, a lot of intellectual and theological developments had taken place, which made things sound quite different. The ideas deleted in Solon's speech, that God is thonoros, that is grudging, jealous, or envious of human prosperity and happiness, was a commonplace in classical thought, linked with the instability of good fortune and the dangers of complacency or arrogance. Plato's speaker Timaeus in the Timaeus objected in principle to the notion of a grudging or jealous God, starting from the basic principle that God is good and consequently doesn't envy or begrudge anything to his creations. And this idea became a staple of Hellenistic um, or Hellenic philosophy and theology Platonic, Jewish, and Christian over the following millennia. Um, Aristotle repeats it on two occasions, as do later Platonists, Plotinus and Plutarch. Um, I'm not going to dwell on these. And it took a, a central place in Christian Platonism from Philo and Oregon through, um, through to the early church fathers and theologians of various stripes, all the way through to the scholasticism of Aquinas. But if there was a wide consensus on the fact that Herodotus uh, must have been wrong about God, um, because God was not Thonoros, um, but rather the opposite, um, the classical Greek notion of divine Thonos was anything but dead in Greco-Christian culture. It lived on, but by the interpretatio Christiana, whereby your gods are my evil demons, it was not an attribute. Thonos was not an attribute of Yahweh, God, but rather of Satan. Eusebius, for instance, gives diabolical Thonos as an important role in his accounts of the church history, um, opposing Yahweh's plans for salvation and the wisdom of Solomon, apparently in reference to the fall of Adam and Eve, um, describes this um, as the result of the Thonos of the devil. This is, of course, all very strange. Uh, one might really have expected Yahweh, an Elkanah or jealous God, according to the Hebrew Bible, to have become a Theos Thonodos in the Greek tradition, but it's crucial to understanding the reception of Herodotus that this did not happen in Jewish and Christian culture. Uh, Yahweh's jealousy was insistently translated as Zdelos in the Septuagint, and the Greek and later Greek Christians maintained their twin allegiance to Hellenistic and biblical theology by insisting that Yahweh was Zdelotes but absolutely not Thonoros. This somewhat tendentious opposition between two forms of supernatural jealousy, the Thonos of the devil and the Zdelos of Yahweh must have puzzled ancient pagans, but by late antiquity and certainly by the Byz late Byzantine period, it had become an uncontroversial part of Christian thought, um, inextricably embedded in tr tr Greek translations of scripture. So this may seem like a strange tangent, but we need it here to understand um, that Herodotus has Solon pronounced a theology, which is in some sense the opposite to Platonic and Christian belief that God is characterized by ultimate generosity and goodness, and therefore an absolute lack of thonos. What Herodotus says about the divine in the speech of Solon is what contemporary Byzantine Christians said about Satan. So it's clear why all philosophically educated Byzantines of Plato's day, Platonist or Christian, might have objected to the content of Solon's speech, which talks about God as if he were the devil. The point was particularly hard to miss for Herodotus's admirers, since Plutarch, another Platonist, accuses Herodotus of blasphemy in his De Herodoti Malignitate, which we know Pletho read because we've got a series of excerpts from it in his hand. Pletho himself laid particular stress on God's lack of thonos in various different speeches, um, which he delivered for um, for nobles within the, um, the, the court of Mistra. Um, 
In a 1450 funeral speech for Helena Dragas, widow of Manuel II, he touches on the themes of fortune and misfortune and affirms the immortality of the soul by reasoning that God must be, quote, perfectly good and without thonos, and so have endowed humanity with a nature similar to his own, which is to say immortal. And the view comes up elsewhere, both in Pletho's writings and those of students or people connected to him, including in his own funeral eulogy by Gregory the Monk. Uh, so Pletho is a reasonable candidate for these deletions that we looked at, but he's scarcely the only person who might have performed them. We come close to an understanding what's going on if we notice how selectively the deletion uh, takes place in Herodotus's manuscript. Whoever was responsible for it, despite their painstaking work, composing an ionic, an ionic paraphrase of in Herodotian style and language to replace Solon's original words, removed the statement about divine phthonos only here. But the theme actually comes up elsewhere. Amatus and Artabanus, Egyptian and Persian sages, repeat Solon's words almost verbatim. Now our manuscript, T, carries the text of these speeches undisturbed, so it's only in the speech of Solon that it was rewritten, which suggests that the problem for the, uh, that they posed in the mind of the person who rewrote them was um, not the fact that Herodotus's text per se contained heretical ideas, but rather something more specific about who was supposed to be saying them. And this, I think, makes the connection with Pletho clear. Early in his laws, Pletho stakes out his own intellectual lineage as he saw it. One of his most interesting claims is that his philosophical views had been held by all the great lawgivers, philosophers, and sages of the past. Um, although he completely omits the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, but aside from the Judeo-Christian tradition, all the great philosophers, lawgivers, and sages of the past from Zoroaster to Iamblichus. Um, this might seem outlandish, but really it's um, a, a pagan antipod to the Judeo-Christian tradition, which typically made the same claims about a diverse series of authors writing in Hebrew and Greek, whose texts became part of the biblical canon. Now, in the laws, Pletho lists these sages as Zoroaster, Eumolpus, Minos, Lycurgus, Iphthitus, Numa, the Brahmins of India, and the Medians of Media, uh, Media Tiresias, Chiron, and the Seven Sages, including Solon, Solon of Athens. And he also includes, of course, Pythagoras, Plato, Parmenides, Timaeus of Locris, Plutarch, Plotinus, Porphyry, and Iamblichus, all of whom purportedly um, anticipated Pletho in his views on all major topics. This genealogy of sages resembles the Prisca Theologia tradition of later Renaissance Platonists like Ficino, but what's interesting about Pletho's version is that no interest is taken in biblical antecedents, and there's no mention of Abraham, Moses, Hermes Trismegistus, and so on, who Judeo-Christian apologists claimed since antiquity um, had provided the impetus for all Greek philosophy. Uh, Pletho's sages are all firmly pagan. But if Pletho's, Pletho was a devoted Neoplatonist, even Plato didn't seem to conform in every instance with Pletho's views. But this, unfortunately, was so much the worse for Plato. As Pagani has shown in a really interesting article several years ago, Plato seems to have been responsible for deleting a large number of passages and words in codices of Plato, which he presumably owned. Among other things, in the story of the myth of Ur, which describes the reincarnation of human souls in animal forms, which Plato disapproved of. Um, and we can see that in a deletion which is somewhat less subtle than the ones I showed you earlier. Pagani also argued in a short postscript to that article that Plato was responsible for the second deletion we noted in T on the Persians calling the circle of the sky its use, because he viewed the ancient Persians as representatives of the views of Zoroaster. And on his view, um, the Zoroastrian, Zoroaster and the Persians couldn't possibly have thought something like that. Um, given Plato's treatment of Plato and his claims about Zoroaster, this seems extremely likely. And I think the same ex explanation applies to Solon's speech. We know that Plato took a particular interest in Solon um, because he says in a funeral oration 
1433 for Cleogby Malatesta, um, that um, he describes Solon as um, a sophos and paraphrases his invocation to look to the end of life, which seems to have our, precisely our passage of um, in Herodotus in view, um, the meeting between Solon and Croesus. So these two deletions seem to be um, unambiguously the work of, place, of Pletho, since they align both with his particular theological concerns and with his um, interventionist practices as attested in, in his uh, Codices of Plato. Pletho was the kind of reader who actively tampered with ancient texts to expunge ideas which contradicted his claims. More specifically, the deletions in T are tailored only to expunge theological heresy from people Pletho includes in his chain of wisdom, but not individuals who don't make it in, for example, Amasis and Artavanus. We can also date these deletions, um, namely to the period between 1372, when Constantinus copied T in Astros, and 1436, when Bessarion copied it in Mistra. Constantinus's manuscript has the original text of Solon's speech, and Bessarion's the Baudelarized one. And this suggests that Pletho had already cultivated his beliefs about the pagan Prisca Theologia at the latest by early 1436, and therefore before the Council of Florence Ferrara, not as John Monfasani recently suggested um, in the early 1440s, um, which in terms of Pletho's impact in Italy um, is, uh, is an interesting, has interesting implications. So this leads on to another question, which is what Pletho really thought he was up to. Is this an expression of intellectual distaste, simply an attempt to make the manuscripts more palatable to him while, while doing his private reading? Is it an attempt to sanitize his texts for teaching and instruction, to remove the authority of Solon from a distorted view of classical pagan culture and specifically the sages whom Pletho himself praised? Uh, an intervention in manuscripts, of course, is an alteration of the historical record and inherently a public facing act, especially if the manuscripts are being used in a circle of active readers and, and, um, and scholars of Herodotus who are making their own copies. These were, of course, the days when many might count themselves lucky to have at one point had prolonged access to a single copy of particular ancient texts. But if it was an attempt to rewrite history, it seems not to have been a particularly systematic one. There's no sign that Pletho rewrote any other manuscripts of Herodotus which didn't belong to him. Although, although we do know that at least once after he made this deletion, he compared T with another manuscript from a different textual tradition for the purpose of copying in the missing bifolium. If he tampered with that text too, then it's been lost because we don't have any record of this rewriting coming up anywhere else in any manuscript which isn't a copy of T. So it may be that Pletho considered his deletions and rewritings of Plato and Herodotus not to be falsifications, but rather corrections. He was obviously aware that the views which he attributed to some ancient thinkers didn't square with the manuscripts he read. He might have concluded from this that his claims were false. Alternatively, he might have believed that the manuscripts transmitting those texts or authors like Herodotus who provided reports about ancient philosophers like Solon were simply incorrect. Now, to my knowledge, Pletho never suggests any theory that Plato's texts might have been corrupted or tampered with by later readers, the kinds of claims which Rufinus made on behalf of Oregon in the Oregonist controversy which brought him into bitter conflict with Jerome. But in the case of Herodotus, Pletho need not have viewed his deletions as an attempt to hide inconvenient truths, but he may have viewed them as an attempt to uh, put the historical record straight as it were, and to restore the truth to a corrupted account. If the relevant sections of the histories are read not as a literary fantasy of intrinsic value per se, um, but rather as a window onto the ancient world, a kind of report of archaic Greece, whose value lies in the information which it contains, then Pletho may have considered himself within his rights, deleting and or rewriting sections of Herodotus, which were, in his view, clearly incorrect. Plutarch accuses Herodotus of slandering the great man Solon by putting blasphemous words in his mouth, 
And it seems that Pletho, at least in some sense, agreed and undertook to defend Solon, thereby supporting his own theories about Solon's beliefs. It's a curious irony that the only report we have of Pletho's activity or active engagement in the Council of Florence Ferrara, preserved by Siropolos, reports a speech by Pletho accusing the Latins of forging the text of the Filioque Clause, alleged to be part of a conciliar decree of 767. Pletho argued from the absence of any direct mention of the alleged conciliar decree in medieval Latin sources. He claimed that if such a decree had existed several hundred years ago, they would definitely have mentioned it rather than going into elaborate syllogistic um, uh, theories and reasonings because it stood there in black and white. But since no medieval Latin text mentioned it, it must have been, it must not actually be an ancient um, or an old um, statement, but rather have been something which was forged in a recent period. And clearly um, we can see that Pletho had before this date um, been busy forging texts of his own. So um, this suggests that Pletho knew, um, knew something and was interested in the principle of, of literary forgery. What precisely the relationship is between these two facts um, we can discuss later. Returning to T then, we can conclude for sure that Pletho owned and worked closely with the manuscript for some time before 1436 when Basarion copied it. Given that he was also responsible for making a number of changes after 1436, including the insertion of the bifolium, it seems clear that Pletho repeatedly returned to T over a period of at least several years, more likely several decades, sometimes comparing the text with others which passed through his hands, and sometimes simply tracing over the words painstakingly so that they could be better read, something which we find in over half of the pages of T, which I suspect is also the work of Pletho. Now, I'm aware that many of you are probably already following the wise injunction of um, Solon and looking to the end, but um, I'd like to finish with just one brief um, and slightly less dramatic textual intervention, which shows another side of Pletho as editor and interpreter. And this um, is a correction which occurs at the gamma stage of T um, and was adopted by both of the 20th century editions of Herodotus, although not associated with Pletho's name. Um, by which I mean the, the Hudes OCT revised by Powell and the Teubner edition of Haim Rosen. For most of you who first read Herodotus in these um, editions, rather than Nigel Wilson's recent OCT, this conjecture will actually be the text that you know of Herodotus. It occurs in the speech, in, in Solon's description of the poor but fortunate man at 132.6. All of the manuscripts here transmit a text which is, which seems to be defective. The poor man is, quote, not as able to bear arter and desire as the rich man, but good fortune keeps these things from him. The poor man is without experience, aperos, not sick, does not suffer ills, fortunate in his offspring, good looking. That the fortunate man should be, quote, without experience has struck many as odd because it doesn't seem to fit the context. Pletho's solution is ingenious. He alters the epsilon iota diphthong still found in Constantinus's copy of 1372 to an eta, which is found in Bessarion's copy of 1436. The sense then becomes unmaimed, a hapax legomenon, but with, a cl with close Herodotian cognates like enperos, maimed, which used twice later in book one. Pletho's conjecture is, um, is, is fairly elegant. It posits um, a confusion of the two iota sounds in later pronunciation. Um, there are other types of correction which are of this sort um, looking, which, which mainly attempt to restore sense to passages which we can see by comparing uh, other parts of the textual tradition to passages which are simply corrupt. And there Pletho is not only um, sometimes very smart, but characteristically overconfident, which I think builds up um, an interesting picture of his own activity and his own way of dealing with ancient texts and their problems. But I think um, I've already talked to you enough about Byzantine textual criticism, so I will stop now 
and um, we can talk about anything people um, would like in the discussion. Thank you very much.